for a Recording's now in progress. Thank you very much for asking me to speak at Newcastle Radiology Society and IR Juniors. Uh, it is actually a great honour. Um, I don't know if you know, I actually qualified from Newcastle University um, an awful long time ago now. That, that doesn't seem that long ago. And I'm very impressed you've got a radiology society. Radiology's always been very underrepresented in, in medical schools and have a society to promote their interests, I think is absolutely fantastic. What I hope to do over the next uh, probably hour at the most is um, promote interventional radiology and particularly Euro intervention and show you some of the things that I've done over the last few years in Euro intervention. Hopefully it'll be some interesting stuff for you to see. Um, it's a bit like this slide. What I'm about to tell you is going to change your life forever. Are you sure you really want to know it? Well, I hope you do want to know it. So go back to my first slide. This is a lesson in point. This is my youngest son. Um, just before the last lockdown, we decided to go snow kiting just on, a, on some fields just south of Gateshead. And this is a lesson to make sure you have all the right gear when you're doing for your intervention, because we went with all the gear, kites, skis, everything, snowboard, and I went without my ski boots having left them at home in the side alley. So I was relegated to taking photographs whilst he had all the fun. So that's the first lesson, have all the right gear and know how to use it. So why do I do Euro intervention? Well, first of all, you're all just great people to work with. Uh, they're really nice, nice people. We work as a really good team. They do what they're good at. I do what I'm good at. We have a variety of pathologies, benign and malignant. And I very quickly realized doing Euro IR that I could provide the full package for the urologists. I could do the diagnostic stuff. I could do the interventional stuff. And I could do everything they're really asking for. So we work very well as a team. And I've been doing this really now for about 20 years with varying degrees of success and, of course, many failures. But I'm not going to show you my failures because um, that would take far too long. So we'll talk about the successes. We'll go through a bit of intervention in the kidney, ureter, bladder. We're going to work our way from the top all the way down. We'll talk a bit about trauma and a bit of our interventional oncology. So one of the commonest things we do are nephrostomies. Um, this used to be a core radiological procedure, but it's now um, really been relegated just to IRs to do. And generally, this is a procedure where we put a tube into the kidney uh, kidneys being blocked most often this is due to stones or malignancy and these patients are often septic it's a common on-call emergency procedure and it's a in fact it's a life-saving procedure so it's a very good thing to be able to do and the way we do this is usually with ultrasound we first of all puncture the kidney you can see a big dilated collecting system here here's my needle coming in down into the collecting system and once I get into the kidney, I aspirate the urine or pus, depending on what comes out, to decompress it. Because what I don't want to do is pressurize the system and cause a septicemia. I then put in a small amount of neat contrast to show me where I am. And then once I've confirmed it correctly in the kidney, I can put a guide wire in and then I can insert this tube. So this you can see there's multiple holes in the end of this tube. This is a locking pigtail. So once it's in, I can pull the thread tight and it locks that loop at the end in place. And that will help the tube. Um, stay without it coming out, without it falling out. So if you see most tubes, when you put them in, if you rotate them a little bit, they go and they slip through very, very easily. Once that's in, I just lock the mechanism at the top and that's it fixed in, fixed in place. What I don't want it to do, of course, is then fall out. And this happens on the wards. When patients go back to the wards and they've had an interventional radiology procedure, the nurses treat it as a very trivial thing. They don't realize some of these procedures are quite major and they don't tend to take as much notice of what we've done as a surgical wound. So we put them in this bag. So this is like a stoma bag and it means there's nothing that the patient can catch that tube on and pull it out. So it's a very good way to fix these in. Something we're always aware of is this is what I call a lava sign. When you inject your contrast, you see it trickle like lava, like a lava flow or like treacle just going down the ureter. And this is because the contrast, which is dense, is just sitting on a layer of pus. Now, when you've got the patient prone, you can't see that pus when you aspirate it out because it's all layered to the front. But when you inject the contrast, you can see it. And that's a sure sign you've got to be ultra careful with these patients so you don't render them septic. Now, these patients, this is a non-dilated system. Sometimes a patient's had the ureter cut during surgery, gynecological surgery, or they've had major trauma and the system is non-dilated. And these are very hard to do nephrostomies on because the kidney is not blown up like a balloon on ultrasound. So what I do here is I put my needle into where I think the collecting system is with ultrasound, and then I slowly inject some contrast. You can see it going in here. And then I probe with a hydrophilic guide wire. And these are what we use in our trees. These are made by Terumo or Merit, and they're very slippy wires when they're wet and it will find its way through the narrowest space. So I probe away, I keep probing, 
and you've got to be very persistent with these non-dilator systems. And eventually I get the wire to go. And the wire's gone straight across the midline. This wire actually has gone into the renal vein. And if I kept pushing it, it would go up the IVC and into the right atrium. What I don't want to do then is put in a big eight and a half French tube because we get a lot of blood coming out through that. But when, I know, when I'm in the renal vein, I know I'm very, very close to the collecting system because it runs very, very close to it. So I take my needle out, take the wire out, reposition it, try again. And eventually, with more careful probing, it, I know it looks fairly random, but there is a little bit of skill involved in this. I'll get that wire to go where I want it to go. And these are the same techniques we're using in artery. These techniques for uroradiology are exactly the same as vascular radiology. And there you see the wire has gone down the ureter and I know I'm in the right place. Now, sometimes these are very difficult. You can see this one looks a bit like a dog's dinner because I've been injecting my contrast when I thought I was in, but it didn't actually go in. And then it just spreads out around the kidney and makes it very hard to see what you're doing. And you can see here, really, where is the collecting system in there? It's virtually impossible to see. Eventually, I do get into it and I get the wire to go down the ureter and then I can put I can put the tube in now as we say in interventional radiology every day is a school day and this is next one is a case I did three weeks ago and the slide says it all I'm still learning we learn all the time so I put my wire in non-dilated system I was probing and probing and probing and eventually the wire goes and it goes down where I think is the ureter but I'm, I'm ultra careful because I've been caught out before, so I always check. So I then went and put in some X-ray dye, some contrast, and it's in this tubular structure. And this is the left gonadal vein. This goes down to the testicle or the ovary, and that's the last place I want to be putting my nephrostomy tube. So that's a lesson in point. Always check with contrast where you are. So again, pull it back, repositioned, and we got into the right place eventually, which in fact is this slide here. So eventually we got down that ureter and got the nephrostomy in successfully. So always be careful with these. Now, a lot of you have got iPhones, I would imagine, and you think, can you do a nephrostomy with an iPhone? Well, sorry to tell you, you can't, but if you've got an Android phone, you're sorted. Because what you can do, you can use this thing called a Philips Lumify, and all the technologies in the probe, you can connect it up to the bottom of your Android smartphone, and then you can do a nephrostomy. And I think this is a world's first. The more astute people here will notice this is actually someone's neck. Um, but that was just to demonstrate it. This is actually a kidney, which was blown up like a rugby ball. To be honest, I didn't really need ultrasound for this. It was so big. But there you see, this is how good these little machines are. And this is resting on a stand on one of our portable machines. So it's actually a tiny, I'm just doing this on a small Android smartphone. So the technology now is really, really good. So let's move on to kidney stones now. So we deal with these an awful lot. They can be the tiniest stone here, can cause you the most horrendous renal colic. You can have multiple jack stones here, or you can have a complete staghorn calculus. And we're very heavily involved in removing these stones along with the urologists. If you leave them, they're a major cause of morbidity and even mortality, because these patients die from sepsis. And there are lots and lots of different ways to treat these stones. So we do what's called a PCNL. So this is a CT scan coronal reconstruction. And you can see a large stone here. You couldn't treat this with shockwave lithotripsy from outside the patient. What you have to do is make a hole in the kidney and take this stone out. Now, back in the day, even before my time, they would open up the kidney, take the stone out, close the kidney up. And of course, years later, the patient grows another stone. You have to open up the kidney and eventually they get renal failure because the kidney gets destroyed. So what we do now is we put a small hole in the kidney. We do this as a combined procedure with the urologists in theater. This is a real team approach and it's called a PCNL or percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Uh, it's one of the more challenging things I do in interventional radiology, apart from the ablation I did this morning, more about that later. Do about two of these a week. We've got one of the biggest series in the world. In fact, I think we're probably the second biggest series in the world. And we have lots of recurrent stone formers, patients coming back all the time. And these are the large stones that we treat. And some of these patients have got really bad anatomy. So if you look at this patient here, his head's up this end under a warmer, his feet are down here, he's prone on the operating table. The clue to his problem is the scar on his back. He had bad spina bifida. And this here is a huge abdominal wall hernia with most of his abdominal contents herniated through into it, but thankfully not his kidney. So you look at this and you think this is gonna be a complete nightmare to get into this kidney, but put the ultrasound probe on and his kidney was in the normal position and actually it was a very straightforward PCNL. 
This is a more normal patient. We've got them prone on the operating table. Bend the table like this a little bit, and then you can open the gap up between the 12th rib and the, kid and the, the iliac crest. We then make a puncture in the skin. We've got a catheter up from below. So the urologist puts a catheter up the ureter, puts some contrast in the kidney so we can see where to puncture. And we puncture using direct fluoroscopy. So we're making an incision here. It's getting a bit surgical, isn't it? We then pop the needle in and we can guide it directly onto the collecting system that's full of contrast. And you see right peristalsis? And there's the catheter put up from below. So we guide this needle, it's quite a big needle, 18 gauge needle down onto the collect calyx. And once we get into that calyx, it's just like a nephrostomy. We can put a guide wire in and we can put it down the ureter. Once that guide wire is down the ureter like that, we can go on, if we can go on to the next slide and we put in these dilators. And these are telescopic dilators. The first one's flexible. We put that all the way into the collecting system. And then we put in bigger and bigger dilators over it. So you see they get bigger and bigger. And this requires quite a lot of strength to get these in, particularly in a patient who's had lots of operations before and they're very scarred. We then slide a sheath over that. Then we take all the dilators out and we let the urologist put the scope in here. So he's put the scope in and then using that, they can put instruments down and take out bits of kidney stone. And once that's done, we seal up the hole at the end putting a ureteric stent in and the patient can go home often the day after, almost the day after surgery. Now, one of the things we can do that you all just aren't fam very familiar with is we use a lot of different shaped catheters and we use these in the vascular tree. And of course they can all be used in the ur urinary tract as well. So there's a little cluster of stones here that even with this flexible fiber optic scope that you all just couldn't get onto. So what I did was I put a catheter in called a sosomni or a shepherd's crook. And you can see why it's called a shepherd's crook because it looks just like one. Funny that, isn't it? So I put it in and I hooked it back into this calyx and injected very hard saline. And what it did is it flushed these stones down. If you look carefully, they're here and then one's there and then it's flushed down there into the renal pelvis. And once it's in the renal pelvis down here, we can fish them out. The other thing we can do, this is using a laser and this is actually the urologist to have this little toy to play with. And this is a patient who had lots of stones underneath this layer of mucosa. And this is something we regretted doing because these stones are actually fairly safe here and eventually would erode through. But at the moment, what we've done, we're taking the covering off and all the stones are free and they're all going to pop out. And then we've got to fish them out. So what I then do is I go in with this basket and we try and fish them out. But with this basket, these are actually too small and they slip through the sides of the basket. But actually, in fairness, these are small enough just to be washed out. So these were just washed out. So there's lots of different bits of kit we can use to take stones out. After the procedure, we just leave in a ureteric stent, and that means that's a double pigtail stent down the ureter, so if there's any blood clot or little fragments of stone, the patient doesn't get obstructed. So that's a PCNL, that's what we do, and we glue the tract at the end and they're left with this little, little incision. This is really is sort of keyhole or pinhole surgery. Now I'll just show you a different type of ureteric stents. The normal stents we put in a double J pigtail stents. This is one made out of a shaped memory metal. This is called nitinol, and it's something we use for vascular stents as well. But this one called the Memocath is a bit weird. It, it changes its shape at a different temperature to the ones we normally use in the body. So when it heats up, it expands the top end. And that's what these metals do. They try and retain their original shape at a certain temperature. And when you cool it down, it becomes plastic and you can pull the stent out. So this is one you can remove by cooling it down with cold saline. And we tend to put this across benign or malignant strictures. And it's quite an unusual sort of stent to use. We don't use it that often. It's quite difficult to change. But I'll just show you its shape memory metal properties here. So well, this is one we've taken out and you can see the coil spring is all unraveled. And what we do now is you put it into a cup of hot water. You watch what happens with it. So it's not even touching the water before it regains its original shape. And once it's regained its original shape, of course, you can just give it a quick wipe down and use it all over again. Not true, of course. They're quite expensive, these stents. And there you go. You can see it's gone back to its original shape. So a very clever sort of metal, and we use nitinol an awful lot. Unfortunately, these stents, like, like all these larger stents, they're prone to migration. So this is a normal double J pigtail stent. This patient had a recurrent stricture, so we thought we'd put in one of these memocaths. We balloon dilated the stricture with an angioplasty balloon. We put in the memocath, we expanded the top end, 
And six months later, or a year later, in fact, there it is, it's migrated up into the kidney. So we then had to fish it out, which was difficult. So we put a basket in, up the ureter, through a scope, grabbed hold of the stent, and then pulled it back down the ureter. So these are tricky stents and they do migrate. These are the other covered stents we use. This one's called the Juventa. Uh, it's not named after a football team, it's Juventa, not Juventus. And this one's called the Allium. We use this one quite a lot. About 20% of these will migrate though. These ones don't migrate, but because they don't migrate, we only use them in malignant conditions because you can't remove them. They're very hard to remove, they get stuck. This one, because it's easier to remove, of course, is prone to migration. So in some of the benign stricture, we'll use this one called an allium. So I'll show you that now. This is a patient who'd had a renal transplant and the transplants over here, they've got a double pigtail stent through the ureter into the bladder and the bladder's pushed across the left-hand side of the pelvis. This is a drain because there's a hole in the ureter and there's a big collection here and this drain is draining it out. There's the ureteric stent across the midline there's the big collection and that's the compressed bladder. So what one of my colleagues did is he got up the ureter from below with the urologist, got a guide wire up, and then you probably can't see this very well, but he actually placed one of these allium stents. But if you put x-ray dye in, there it is there. It's going down. I'll just go back a slide. There's the hole in the ureter. So that's the x-ray dye, the contrast leaking out. So we had to seal that hole with this covered stent. And this is what we did. And this is exactly what we do with holes in arteries as well. We seal them with very similar stents to this. And if you look at the CT scan afterwards, the contrast is there, it's layered posteriorly, it's running down. And here you can see that collection has shrunk. And this is some months later, the drains have been removed and it's gone. So these stents are really useful. This is what they look like after a year. They do encrust. So there's a little bit of sort of bullous reaction at the top. There's a bit of calcification on the inside of the stent, but because it's such a big lumen, you can leave these in for a long time and they don't block up or don't block as quickly as double J pigtail stents do. Those you have to change after about three months, whereas this you can leave in for a year. So it is advanced. When you take it out, it unravels and it looks horrible like that. It doesn't reform like the Memocath does. This is the Juventus stent. This is a patient who had, this is a sort of side on view, if you like, there's the ureter coming down for the contrast. Then here is a really tight stricture due to a rectal cancer that was invading the ureter. So this patient had a very limited life expectancy. We don't, didn't want to leave him with an aphrostomy draining with a bag on his side. So we wanted to stent him. So we're putting in one of these Juventus stents and you'll see the stent going in in a moment and what happens to the ureter. So we've got a guide wire down, there's the stent and we uncover the stent, and as we uncover it, it slowly expands. And when it expands fully, you'll see the contrast wash down the ureter. There, and you can see the contrast now flowing down the ureter. And he lived some months more after that, before he died from his metastatic malignancy. Now, I quite like this slide. This is, this is called Barbarians at the Gates. And what I'd like to talk about now is interventional oncology, which is one of the most rapidly growing areas of interventional radiology and an area I've got quite a large interest in. So the reason I've got this slide barbarians at the gate is because this is what the urologist called us. So this is a, this is a paper in 2005 when we started doing this percutaneous image guided urological procedures, barbarians at the gate. They were worried that we were going to take over the world. We were going to put them all out of business. We were going to stop all their surgery. And what they said, they said, what did they say? Uh, the advantage of ablative therapy to patients are significant. This technique can be performed on an outpatient basis with sedation, post-procedural pain is minimal, with most patients not requiring narcotics. All things that open surgery cannot do. So we are the best at this sort of stuff, but this is not a cure for everything. So this never really turned into a turf war and we aren't the barbarians at the gate and the urologists are not worried and they've got no reason to be worried. We can't deal with really big tumors. So what can we do with small tumors? First of all, you can just watch a small tumor. It might grow, might stay the same. If it's an old patient, they're probably gonna die of something else. You could do a laparoscopic partial nephrectomy or a robotic partial nephrectomy, minimal morbidity, but not as safe as ablation. So we could put a needle in and we can kill the tumor that way. So we can use radiofrequency energy, microwave energy, 
we can freeze it with cryotherapy or we can electrocute the tumor something called ire I'll, I'll go through all of these options in a moment for you so slow growing tumors small tumors are relatively slow growing they rarely metastasize and they don't often kill patients but of course small tumors become big tumors and you want to treat them when they're small under four centimeters so how many patients given the option of a minimally invasive procedure almost done as an outpatient where they can go home usually the same day would want you to just sit on their tumor and watch it well, i wouldn't if i had it growing inside me i'd say well can you do something about it please i don't really want to watch it for another year or two most patients want something doing unless they're really really unfit and this is why it's very hard to do a controlled trial saying which is best take it out with surgery or kill it with ablation most patients given the option if they consented properly say well actually i want the safest option i want ablation and we now know our, our cure rate is as good as surgery so partial nephrectomy does have significant complications they have problems stopping bleeding they have problems closing the collecting system and of course you can't block the blood supply to a kidney for more than about 15 to 20 minutes or it's going to become ischemic so there are problems with this technique so who do we do these ablations on well patients that you all just don't want to treat basically patients with anesthetic risk patients to avoid dialysis by that i mean patients with hereditary conditions where they get recurrent renal tumors such as vhl von hippel lindau which i'm sure you know, all know all about and vhl they get recurrent renal tumors and you can't go on chopping out bits of the kidney and a lot of patients want ablation small renal tumors they'd rather have ablation so how does it work? Well, the first thing we started doing was RF ablation. Radio frequency energy agitates the ions, heats the tumour up, kills it. And the way we do this is with the more needles you put in, the bigger the tumour you can treat. If you believe what the manufacturers tell you, which I don't, you can treat up to 6.7 centimetres in size. In reality, you're never going to achieve that. So we turn the patient into an electrical circuit. We put grounding pads on the legs. That's one half of the circuit. So the current diffuses there. The other half of the circuit is the sharp needle which is this, which we put into the tumour. And that's where the focal energy is. That's where the heating occurs, of course, in the tumour. Multiple needles give you a bigger kill area. How do we do it? We do it in the CT under local anaesthetic. This patient's almost wide awake. He's maybe slightly drowsy. I've put lots of local all the way down to the tumour. All he can feel is pushing. I then move the patient into the scanner, line them up, readjust my position until I get it bang on in position what i can't do is scan whilst my hands are in the middle of the scanner because if i do that i'm going to radiate my hands so we do multiple scans check our position then we turn the machine on heat it up for about 12 minutes in this case that will kill the tumor we can do combined procedures i'm just going to pause here and rewind slightly so this is a patient who had von hippel lindau they had a large tumor in the lower pole of the kidney two smaller tumors in the upper pole so the urologist said, well, I'll use the robot, take out the lower pole tumour. If you can RF ablate the upper pole tumour at the same time, that would be great. So here I am in theatre, fighting amongst the robot arms, trying to use the wrong hand to make, uh, to get in through the skin here, which they've, they've kindly marked for me, so I know where to go. And you, you've got to imagine here that sometimes the surgeon can feel a little bit left out. So what I'm very kind, I let the surgeon make the incision. And he made the little skin incision. This was the urology registrar. Apologies to him because he's probably been a consultant for many years now. And if he sees this, he'd be very upset. Uh, and there I am putting the needle in. Now with my other hand, because I have to swap hands here, I've got to operate a laparoscopic ultrasound probe, which is through one of these ports. And I'm going to guide my needle in. There's the needle there. There's the probe. That's a retractor that the surgeon's holding. And if you look, you'll see the needle come in sideways through the tumour. It's easy to see, very easy to see, because the surgeon can spot it. Anything a surgeon can spot on ultrasound is easy to spot. Joking apart, I, um, I always pull a leg of surgeons and I say this to the face as well, and they take the mick out of me as well. There's my needle there, and once it's in, you'll see it heating up, and you'll see this tumour start to bubble and the steam coming off it. There you go. And we treated this patient successfully, and I was on call that night, and... Um, the patient was bleeding. So where do you think they were bleeding from? Partial nephrectomy site, of course, not from the ablation. So I took the patient down to the angio room. Ah, I've missed the slide out. That's a shame. I've got an angiogram here to show you. And I found the bleeding point. Let me just get that up on my other screen because I do have it somewhere. 
give me a second. Uh, right, so this is what we did. Oh, it's playing on my other screen. That would happen, wouldn't it? Right, forget it. Anyway, we embolized it and it was successful and the patient was fine. So they came to no harm from that. So it is quite hard to get hemostasis. Now, the other way you can treat these tumors with, is with cryoablation. So we can freeze the tumor. So why would we do that? Well, we do it for larger tumors. It works better for larger tumors. You can see what you're ablating. You can see the ice ball. You can't see that with RF or microwave. You can avoid adjacent structures because you can see the ice ball. You get a good area of cell death. And the way this works is something called the Jules Thompson effect. So you squirt argon through the needle, it goes through a tiny hole, and as the gas expands, it cools the needle. A bit like when you let the air out of your bike tire, you can feel it getting cold. So it's exactly the same thing. This is the setup we use. It's quite complicated. There's a lot of kit in the room. This was an older device we had, and there's a newer device we had this morning, which I'll show you. We have to freeze the tumour twice for 10 minutes, so it takes a long time. This is this morning, actually, this was a case I did about six months ago. We got three needles in and that's us freezing it. This is the case I did this morning. This took me, I thought it was going to take two hours. I was in there for five hours. And had I done it in less time than that, this talk might have been a bit better prepared. So apologies for that. Anyway, this is a slide from this case um, just finished today. We've got eight needles in here in total in this tumour. And there they all are in the back of the machine. And this is us just freezing it. And you can see the ice on there and you can see the vapor coming off it because it's so cold. This will cool the tumor down to minus 140 degrees C and that kills the tumor. And hopefully uh, it doesn't cause any more damage. The other thing we can do is microwave ablation. This gives us really high temperatures. It's very quick and it's my modality of choice. And it works like your microwave oven. It oscillates the water molecules and it does give you a bigger area of ablation. So you get what's called active and passive heating. So the active heating is where the microwaves work and then conduction gives you the passive heating. And that's how all these work. So we've got a small tumor here in the right upper pole. The only path through this to this is through the liver. So it went through the liver. This is called the kamikaze approach, straight down through the liver into the tumor. And you can see how easy it is to see that needle in the liver. And you see the kidney moves as we push the needle into it. Then we heated that up for 60 seconds at 100 watts, and you can see the gas around the end of it. The patient was wide awake, didn't feel very much. That killed the tumor. And there's the ablation zone there and there. And he was recurrent, he's been recurrence free now for five years. And there it is later, later on. This is how we do the microwave. It's very similar to looking at the CT that I showed you before. Um, it's a quicker technique getting the patient to hold their breath, position the needle, because of course as patients breathe, the kidney moves up and down and you want the kidney in the same place each time. We then got the needle in and we're gonna heat it up. And this is one we're doing for about five minutes. Very small machine, much, much simpler than cryoablation. Works really well. You can use multiple needles. And if you use multiple needles and they're combined electronically, radio waves, remember, you get some additive effects where they, they integrate with each other and you can get a much bigger ablation zone. So this is another microwave device we use called the New Wave from Johnson & Johnson. We can put three probes in at the same time. It's cooled by CO2 and the CO2 means you can freeze the needle, a bit like with cryoablation. And that allows you to freeze the kidney in place and freeze your needle in place whilst you put the other needles in to stop everything getting displaced. So it works quite well. So what's the idea? None of these techniques are brilliant because other structures around the kidney will be damaged. The ideal thing we want is for predictable ablation. We want to be able to do large tumours. We want to be able to do different types of tumour. And we don't want the heat to be sucked away by a blood vessel or the frozen bit to be warmed up by a blood vessel. And that can all affect your ablation zone. So we want something to be unaffected by heat sink effects. And we don't want to damage surrounding structures. This does exist, it must exist because this was in the Daily Mail and anything in the Daily Mail, as you know, is true. So this paper, this said, even the trickiest of tumors can be tackled with a new 3000 volt electric needles. Sounds fantastic. This lady thought it was. Um, this was one of the first patients treated by a colleague of mine in Leeds, a lady called Ziwa, who's probably got one of the biggest series of IRE now. So what this is, is irreversible 
electroporation, otherwise known as IRE, or nano knife. Nano knife sounds much more sexy and it's sort of thing the Daily Mail will catch on to. What this, this is, this was discovered many years ago when scientists were trying to put drugs into cells to kill them, they discovered if they put an electrical voltage across the cells, it opened up the pores reversibly. But if they put too high a voltage across it, the cells didn't, the pores did not close. And that became irreversible electroporation. Of course, if the pores don't close, water goes in by osmosis, the cells lies and they die and they get cleared by apoptosis. So this sounds fantastic, doesn't it? This is the machine, it's a quarter of a million. Uh, we've got at least one of these at the Freeman now. The needles are expensive and you need several needles. So you put these needles in and you can do a lesion up to three centimeters, but it takes a long time. And the reason it works is what it does is it kills the tissue, kills your tumor, and it will kill the cells within the blood vessels, but it doesn't destroy the connective tissue. Of course, once the tumor has been killed, those cells don't grow back, so you've got all the tumor, but the cells grow back along the blood vessel and they'll grow back within weeks. So the vessels are not destroyed. So it's a very good technique. The other problem with this is it's got to be cardiac gated. If you electrocute a patient often enough, which is what you're doing with IRE, you'll cause them to go into VF. So it's got to be gated for this just after the S wave, just after the S wave there. So it's good where you don't want to damage other structures or where you fail with thermal ablation. It's got to be done under general anesthetic because you're electrocuting them. It's got to be CT guided and you've got to get the needles really parallel and that makes it very hard to do. So this is a bit of a tumor that I didn't get with RF ablation. I should have microwaved it with hindsight, but we chose to do IRE on it. A week after Z had done her first one. So I was kicking myself because she was first. Not that it really matters, not that we're competitive. And we got the needles in, we ablated it. And this is us ablating it. So we got three needles in. Now bear in mind to get these parallel, you've got to go in between the ribs and the ribs don't play ball. They're not always in the place where you want them to be. So you've got to get them in very, very carefully in the right position. And then you set up your ablation. It's all planned on the computer here. Um, it's, the machine works out the voltage between, between the three needles. You set the number of pulses and then you hit go which you'll see in just a moment. And there we go. And you can see the patient's muscles contracting. This is why it's got to be under GA with very heavy paralysis. Did it work? No, a bit of tumor left after a month. So we did it for a second time. Tiny bit of tumor left after the second go. And after the third go, that's just a blood vessel. So this man I've now followed for about four or five years and he's been tumor free. So it does work. All right, enough about interventional oncology. We'll go back to something benign now, and this is called benign prostatic enlargement, BPE or BPH, as it used to be called, benign prostatic hypertrophy. Something that um, men are prone to as they get older, and it causes problems with micturition, of course, um, delayed bladder emptying, incomplete bladder emptying, poor flow, and recurrent UTIs. A lot of patients will fail med medical therapy for this, and so they need to have a TURP or a TURP was one of the ways of be treating it. There are many other ways, that was the, that's the gold standard, but that can lead to problems. Impotence, five to 10%, urethral strictures, urinary incontinence, retrograde ejaculation, sepsis, hemorrhage, and even death. So it's quite a morbid procedure. There are other techniques, but one of the things we can do now is prostate artery embolization. So you'll have heard of fibroid embolization for treating fibroids, it works really, really well. But many, a few years back, it was discovered that this works for the prostate. So we've been doing it for years for patients with prostate cancer when they've got intractable bleeding. Um, and what was discovered is this was a case report over 20 years ago now in G General Vascular and Interventional Radiology in 2000. They had a patient with persistent hematuria secondary to the BPH. They embolized the hemorrhage, embolized the prostate, stopped the hemorrhage but his PSA dropped from 40 down to four, the prostate volume reduced by 62%, and the patient's symptoms rapidly got better with an IPSS score, that's International uh, Prostate Symptom Score, went from 24 to 13, so the patient was delighted. So people thought, hey, this, this might work for benign disease. So this chap, Francesco Carnavali, was one of the pioneers of this, 
And he did a whole series of these patients. Well, first of all, two patients, and they got an awful lot better. So how do we do it now? Well, we do this again in conjunction with our urologists. They work up the patient, check that they're suitable for PAE. The ideal patient's got a big prostate gland and one gland I did recently was 300 cc's, absolutely massive, too big for surgery. We want a patient that's not too old because the blood vessels get harder to reverse if they're too old and they need a bladder that works. If the bladder's not gonna empty, there's no point in doing it. So the patient's worked up, referred to us, we do a CT to check the vessels first, then we do an angiogram. So this is the left internal iliac artery. There's the posterior division. There's the anterior division. And there, the wiggly line there is the prostatic artery coming down to the prostate gland. And there it is again. And then once we think we're in that, we get a micro catheter in, just two French catheter into there, which is tiny and jet contrast. And there you go, half of the prostate is lighting up. But that's not good enough. We need to make sure that we're not going to embolize anything else. Like if you embolize the penis, the patient's not going to be very happy. Embolize the rectum, you can, they're going to have problems. So we do what's called cone beam CT. So our angiography suite, most modern suites now, this will rotate around the patient doing a basic CT scan. And this is what it looks like. So there you see half the prostate gland filled with contrast. So we know now we can go and embolize this without embolizing anything else. And we've done quite a lot of these patients now at the Freeman, not, certainly not the biggest series by a long shot, but we've had pretty good success with them. We do it with a small particles called embazines. These are like 400 microns and they just block the artery permanently. And we do both sides. Quality of life score, this is it getting better and better and better. And it gets best by about 90 days. So the effect isn't immediate. And there's various, there's been various studies done, meta-analyses, and they've shown patient scores, IPSS score, improved significantly in patients with PAE. So it's safe, it's effective, it's got less complications than surgery. We can do it as an outpatient, it's done with local anesthetic, and it has a similar success in the selected patients to TURP. What we don't know yet is how long, how good the longevity of this procedure is, but we think it's at least 10 years and it certainly will put off the time by which a patient needs to have a PAE. Right, we're gonna move on to trauma. Um, quickly on, we've got a lot to get through. Looks horrific, but he was all right, thankfully. He, he kind of bounced back. Now, mountain bikers, like motorcyclists, wear lots of padding, big helmets, makes them feel very confident. Um, I'm a mountain biker as well, but I don't do anything like that. And I don't wear padding because I don't do anything too dangerous. I'm a bit more wary because I know if I hit a tree or a rock and I've done that many times, I'm going to come off worse. So no matter what padding you've got, if you've got a major deceleration injury, you're going to have major trauma. So we do see a lot of people from mountain bikes and motorcycles and RTAs. So how do we treat patients with major renal trauma? Well, this is a great paper which said, said you treat patients conservatively whenever possible. And how do they know this? Well, they came out with a good statement. They said that the nephrectomy rate is low if the kidney is not operated on. And this was a paper from 2003 where the very specialized urological center lost their urological surgeons who did trauma. So the urologists who were left operated on the kidneys with trauma and they found that whenever they operated, they took the kidney out. So they found it was a bad idea. So they decided it was best not to operate unless the patient was going to die otherwise. And if they didn't operate, a lot of these patients did very well. These are the signs you see, Gray Turner's sign, Fox's sign, retroperitoneal hemorrhage. This is the sort of thing that causes trauma. This is a student decided to climb a lamppost. He fell off, landed across a wall, came in with macroscopic hematuria. He was stable though. So he was quite correctly managed conservatively, but his hematuria didn't settle. And really you should have had a CT earlier because this is his kidney. If you look at the left kidney, it's in bits. But he wasn't too bad clinically, but it was in bits. So what we did was we did an angiogram and there you can see it's almost in half. These are all the bleeding points and pseudoaneurysms. We embolized it with little particles, same as the prostate, a couple of coils there, sorted. So he was fine, went home within a few days. We're seeing more and more penetrating trauma these days, particularly during lockdown. These are two, um, two so-called friends who had a bit of a disagreement in the pub. This patient was scanned in another hospital, then sent to us once they saw the trauma. 
and he had a knife wound in the back. His friend stabbed him in the back, literally. And here's the contrast hosing out here. This patient, my colleague, I think Ralph Jackson did this, when he was wheeled down the corridor, the blood was hosing out off the table onto the floor of the corridor. They went straight into the angio room and he went for angiography. And I'll show you the angiogram. There's the renal angiogram and it's normal. The kidney's not, but the angiogram is normal because where he was bleeding from was this lumbar artery. The knife had sliced straight through the lumbar artery and that then was coiled with a successful result. This is another classic injury. Uh, this is an injury I've come very close to nearly having myself on several occasions from a windsurfer. He got catapulted, so he landed across his boom, squashed his left kidney, ruptured the collecting system. There it is there. So he was managed with a stent to divert the urine. And unfortunately, he then was discovered to have pseudoaneurysms. He had two pseudoaneurysms, one there, one there, which we embolized with a coil. Looks like we took out the lower pole of his kidney, but if you look on the renogram afterwards, some months later, he actually was pretty good. He did pretty well. So 47% function left in the left kidney afterwards, which is pretty much 50-50. This is another one. This is a man who landed on his face fence. Now we're working our way down the body, remember? So in male patients, where are we going to end up? We're going to end up in the penis and the scrotum. This man came in with priapism. Um, you might think that's quite funny, but it's not if you've got it and you've had it for a long time, because what happens is you get fibrosis in the penis and you'll be rendered impotent for the rest of your life. Not a situation you want to be in. So I ultrasounded him on the table before we did the angiogram. And this is a big pseudoaneurysm. There's the artery, cavernosal artery. There's the pseudoaneurysm again. So then I knew I could go to the left hand side. There's the priapism. There's the pseudoaneurysm. This is an internal pedendal artery. And there it is there with a big pseudoaneurysm. So what we did there was we injected some contrast just to prove we're in the right place. And then we embolized it with gel foam. This is a, a, a sort of collagen thing that I mixed with saline into a slurry and then injected it. Now it's a non-permanent embolic. What I don't want to do is permanently occlude his internal pedendal artery because that will leave him impotent, particularly if I have to do both sides. So we just did the one side and uh, the priapism goes down on the table there and now. So very good technique, works very well. Last thing I'm gonna talk about, varicocele embolization. This is another male problem. Women get a similar problem called pelvic congestion syndrome and can lead to vulval varices or just pelvic pain. And it's very much unrecognized. In men, it's quite common, particularly on the left side. You can see it in infertility. Left side is the commonest. Sometimes they're bilateral, rarely it's right-sided only. And how it works is you get reflux from the valve from the gonadal vein off the left renal vein. The other thing you get is something called nutcracker phenomenon, which I didn't really believe in until this week. I'll show you a slide of that. And retroperitoneal masses can cause a varicocele. So nutcracker syndrome is where you get the SMA and the aorta, the left renal vein crosses between the two, and it can get compressed. This is nutcracker syndrome. And if it's compressed, the pressure builds up in the gonadal vein. So this is a patient I scanned this week, uh, apart from I haven't put the slides in. Sorry, he actually, I believe, had nutcracker syndrome and you could see it on his ultrasound. I don't think these are synced on my Dropbox, unfortunately, I'd be, otherwise I'd be able to show you them. Anyway, so we generally do this procedure for patients in pain, sometimes for subfertility and sometimes in adolescence with testicular atrophy. So we gain access through the jugular vein usually. I'll just show you this. So local anesthetic, this is my 10 minute procedure on a Wednesday morning. If they're straightforward, it literally takes 10 minutes from start to finish. Put your local anesthetic in very slowly, otherwise it's very painful. We actually mix it with bicarbonate to neutralize the acidity. There you can see the jugular vein and you'll see the needle going down into the jugular vein. That's my local anesthetic. We then pop the needle in and we put in a shaped catheter through a sheath. And we're going to get that down through the right atrium. There it is coming down. And then we're going to get it across to the left renal vein. And the left renal vein is going to be over here. So you can just see the catheter there coming down. And then we're going to turn it so it's facing south. Get the guide wire down. I think the next slide might show that a bit better. There we go. 
So we're coming back now in the Gnadal vein, proving we're in the right place of contrast. Remember when I showed you the nephrostomy? When we come in, we went down that Gnadal vein by accident. So then we block this with little metal coils made out of platinum. See, it's just coiling up. This is as quick as it is. A couple of these coils, make sure we got all the veins and there's not a parallel vein running next to it. Job done. Little bit of pressure on the neck for about 30 seconds. Patient can go back to the ward and then go straight home. You can do this as an outpatient. So we'll wrap it up here. I've um, got 10 minutes to go. Interventional uroradiology, as I hope you've seen by these videos, is a, gives you a huge variety of techniques, huge variety of pathologies. Lots of different ways to do image guided punctures. Um, there's percutaneous ablation involved. You can treat tumors. Lots of catheter wire techniques. Um, we use them for embolization in all sorts of areas. And it's a hugely rewarding area of interventional radiology. And I will say again, I work with some great urological colleagues and it's um, so far, it's been a very satisfying career. So thank you very much. I'm quite happy to take any questions if you haven't all um, logged off by now or gone to the pub or whatever. Thank you so much, Dr. Haslam, for this absolutely amazing talk. I think it's been really interesting to see there's basically something for everyone. There's radiology, oncology, and even a bit of surgery. So thank you so, so much for giving this talk. Oh, you're welcome. Anybody, if they have questions, you can type it on the chat box and then we can uh, ask Dr. Hassam about it. I'm not sure if I've got the same chat as you, I presume I have, but I can't see anything at the moment. Uh, there's nothing at the moment, but... I don't mind if anyone wants to email me. Uh, my email was on the slides there. It's phil at whichmedicaldevice.com. And Is if... a question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, Rosemary, sorry. <laughs> I do have lots of these videos are on YouTube. If you if you go to YouTube to which medical device, which is a, a, a sort of um, a trip advisor of medical devices, if you like, that I run on a separate website. There's a YouTube channel with loads of these videos on of interventional radiology, not just Euro, all sorts, vascular, HPB, GI, whatever you like. Sorry, Rosemary, go on. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you earlier. Um, so how are you offering um, IRE at your institution? And how did you go, up, go about setting up the service? Right, I didn't set up the service actually. It was done, it was predominantly set up by the hepatobiliary surgeons and my colleague, Pete Littler, because um, they use this for pancreatic tumors predominantly and in excess and liver tumors that are very close to the liver hyaline or the gallbladder and things that you don't want to ablate by any other technique. So they're, they're doing small tumors like that and through the, in the pancreas as well. And it's, it's, it's a very good technique and the needles are quite fine. So they can actually go straight in through the stomach and straight through anything pretty much into the pancreas. So that's how it was funded originally. But the, the actual needles are what we call, um, they're sort of off-label, not off-label devices, they're off tariff. So they get reimbursed directly by by the, by, not directly by the hospital, but by the, what used to be the PCT, but it's all changed lately. So <laughs> there you go. If you have any questions, just ask. Uh, you don't have to be shy. We have a really small group here. So <laughs> hopefully we can make it as interactive as possible. Sorry, do you mind if I ask how you uh, got an interest in interventional radiology? Yeah, well, I um, I first got interested in radiology as a medical student, finally a medical student um, from a radiologist at North Tees who was an interventional radiologist. And he used to teach us radiology in general, not, not interventional radiology on a Friday lunchtime, and it was great. And I then, as a renal SHO at the Freeman, went down to watch uh, a renal artery angioplasty and stenting, and I thought, oh, this looks really good. I'd already thought I was going to do radiology, but in those days you had to do medicine first. So I did MRCP for a few years, medical jobs, and then went into interventional into radiology, planning all along to do interventional radiology. I like all the hands-on stuff, and that's what ticks my, you know, ticks my box basically. <laughs> how did you come about? So, like I said, how did you come about the urology side of things? Because the body's so huge. Um, what makes you so interested in? That yeah. Part of the body? Well. Yeah, good question. I wasn't originally. I, I did my radiology training in Newcastle. I then was lecturer in interventional radiology in Dublin, 
where I worked with a very talented prof and did that for a year. And the job came up back at the Freeman with Euroradiology in it. And I thought, okay, I'll take the job because I got offered it and I'll drop the Euro and just do vascular. And I always planned to do mainly vascular stuff because that's what I thought interventional radiology was. And that's what most people think it is who don't know. Um, after I'd been doing that job for a year, I really enjoyed it. And a vascular job came up and actually I didn't apply for it. I just carried on doing the Euro and I still do vascular. I do pretty much all aspects of intervention apart from EVARs and tips. I've done them in the past, but I don't do them at the moment. So the, the Euro stuff actually is just a huge variety and it's the variety I like in interventional radiology. I wouldn't want to do just one area. I think that probably answers your question. Each to their own though, we all, we all like different things. Thank you. If the audience doesn't have any more questions, I guess uh, we'll just wrap up the meeting today. Thank you for think, Dr. Hassan. Yeah. Right, there is one there actually. Okay, oh. Someone says, um, this might be a silly question, probably not, because I think I've probably heard them all before. Uh, the stent that changes shape with heat, does body temperature affect it? That is actually a very good question, not a silly question. So the nitinol we use in vascular stents tries to regain its original shape at body temperature. So you put them in and then you get a very strong force to push them out. And as we uncover the stent, it springs open. The nitinol you saw in that memocast stent doesn't try and change its shape until you heat it to about 55 degrees. So the way you expand that top end is by squirting hot water at the stent. It's really weird sort of stent to use. And I don't think it's a great stent, but that's what the company came up with. And it works for some people, but the body temperature doesn't affect it. I think everyone's stunned into silence. I think that was such a wide variety of intervention and such a gallop through that it's a bit of a blur, to be honest. <laughs> it was a fascinating talk, for sure. And it was really eye-opening and really interesting. I'm glad you enjoyed it. If uh, So we do have a feedback form um, that is sent over on the chat box. Um, if you guys would like to have a moment, have a moment, please fill out the feedback form and help us tremendously kind of know where people are and you know what we can do to host more great events uh, with radiology society as well as for our, our juniors and uh yeah thank you so much for the presentation tonight dr Hassan. not at all and well done to you all for running the society i'm glad to hear it's been going strong for about 10 years or more it's yeah. it's great and i look forward to hearing hearing more from you and some great things in the future i'm sure all right so um